Good morning, all. Protocol already having been duly established, it leaves only for me to say a very pleasant good morning to the distinguished ladies and gentlemen so gathered today and composing of this most august body. I am indeed pleased to be here to discuss the highlights of our 2024-2025 budget in the context of a sustainable economy. First, we may ask, what is a sustainable economy? There are many definitions, but the most appropriate one that I found arose out of the 1987 Brundtland Report, compiled by the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development to tackle the emerging dichotomy between economic growth and environmental preservation. The report aimed to address this global challenge and focus on the integration of environmental and economic and social considerations to achieve sustainable development. While acknowledging this interconnectedness, the specific aspect that we are focusing on here today is economic sustainability. So again, what exactly does this mean? A sustainable economy, growth, and indeed economy, is an economic system that seeks to balance and integrate, that's the operative word, social, environmental, and economic considerations to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their very own needs. The goal of a sustainable economy is to create long-term prosperity while minimizing negative impacts on the environment, society, and the overall well-being. Some of the key principles of sustainable economy include social equity, ensuring fair and equitable distribution of resources, benefits, and opportunities across the whole social spectrum. Economic prosperity, promoting economic growth that is inclusive, resilient, and does not compromise the well-being of our future generations. Community engagement, and that's what we're doing here today. Involving local communities in decision-making processes and considering their respective needs and aspirations. Resilience. Resilience by building economic systems that are resilient to shocks, including those related to climate change, economic downturns, and other disruptions. Achieving a sustainable economy requires collaboration amongst governments, business communities, and individuals. We must also apply sustainable economic principles to governing budgeting, aligning financial decisions with long-term goals that prioritize social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Some key considerations for integrating sustainability into government budgeting are as follows. We must ensure that budget allocations address social inequities and prioritize programs that enhance the social well-being. Consider the long-term environmental and social implications of infrastructure investment. Prioritize investment that have a positive effect on our social arena, local communities, and encourage public participation in decision-making processes. Develop multi-year budget plans that consider the long-term consequences of fiscal decisions on sustainability. As I noted in my budget policy statement, it seems like a long time ago, but in fact in December, the Cayman Islands is currently playing catch-up to meet the needs of her economic and corresponding physical and population growth. It is therefore vital to maintain and indeed improve the quality of life that we invest in essential infrastructure, social and educational programs, not next year, but now. The government budget is therefore the financial plan 
for achieving the policy outcomes in 2024, 2025, and yes, 2026 for our three-year budgeting processes. That is set out in our SPS, our strategic policy statement. Let us then discuss the broad outcomes that guide our government, my government, the UPM, United People's Movement, in case we forgot, with the development of a sustainable economy. This government has said time and time again of its commitments in maintaining a good relationship with the private sector. In fact, to achieve a private sector driven economy, acknowledging the significant role that the private sector plays in generating activity, which in turn provides goods, services, productivity that is required to have a healthy and vibrant economy. This in turn, ladies and gentlemen, creates employment as well as the most significant percentage of government's revenue. The revenue generated by the private sector driven economy is in turn utilized by our government to provide the very necessary public services such as education, healthcare, and financial assistance and funds key public sector infrastructure projects. A strong and stable economy is an underpinning factor in each of our broad outcomes. Take broad outcome one of improving quality of life for Caymanians. How can we improve the quality of life without a strong economy? Quality of life is defined, and I quote, as an individual's perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and value systems in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards, and concerns, unquote. Key indicators of good quality of life include wealth and employment. Indeed, in the context of improving quality of life as a broad outcome, some of the specific outcomes would include nation building initiatives, sustainability discussions, and socioeconomic policies to ensure that employment and productivity is there to increase both the individual and community wealth. Broad outcome two of enhancing our competitiveness is all about maintaining a strong economy and encouraging economic growth as it refers to the need to continuously improve our economic, social, environmental, and good governance framework in order to ensure that our beloved Cayman Islands remain a viable and attractive place to conduct, operate, and remain competitive. This not only applies to the financial services in relation to the global regulatory requirements, but it is also equally applicable to our tourism, construction, technology, and other emerging industries. Broad outcome three of future proofing to increase resilience also focuses on protecting our economy against future shocks and challenges. We recognize that as the Cayman Islands economy grows and it continues to grow, the world faces transformational shifts in global markets. We must consider potential impacts that may, this may have on our future and then recognize the need to embrace new economic opportunities. So I'm delighted to hear about the Panama trade mission. Future proofing acknowledges our vulnerability as small import dependent islands to external shocks such as natural disasters, supply chain shortages, global conflicts, health or economic crises, and yes, the upcoming US elections. We are looking ahead and attempting to provide security and stability for generations to come, including economically. Broad outcome four of modernizing government to improve public sector performance is also linked to maintaining a strong, stable, and sustainable economy. While growing a population and expanding economic requirements, 
the extension and even creation of new public services, a sustainable approach dictates that greater emphasis be placed on increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of the delivery of government services. This broad outcome serves to bring attention to the role of the public service, which plays a successful, sustainable role in our thriving Cayman Islands. Even broad outcome five, to protect and promote Caymanian culture, heritage and identity is predicated on an economic basis. The need for preservation of our links to the past has been realized through the rapid changes and shifts occurring through our economic growth. However, we must also duly recognize that we need a strong economy to have the relative luxury of being able to fund heritage and culture projects in our jurisdiction. Taking a comprehensive view, it is absolutely clear to me that while the concept of improved and maintained quality of life is specifically stated only in broad outcome one, it is actually a central factor to every single broad outcome we aim as a government to achieve. The key benefit that we are seeking through a sustainable economy is the preservation and improvement of the quality of life for not some of our people, but all of our people. The <laughs> Thank you. The concepts of the quality of life and a sustainable economy are closely interrelated as both, you see, aim to enhance the overall well-being and to ensure the prosperity of current and future generations. A sustainable economy considers the social dimensions of development, emphasizing social equity, access to education, which is affordable, healthcare, and other essential services. These factors directly contribute to an improved quality for life for individuals and, in general, our communities. A sustainable economy seeks to achieve long-term economic prosperity by promoting inclusive growth, ensuring that economic activities include the contribution to the social well-being. If we don't take care of the social needs in the country, rest assured, they will be coming inside of our gated communities. <clears throat> economic prosperity, when distributed fairly, can positively impact the quality of life for a larger portion of our ever-increasing population. Sustainable ec economies recognize the significance of cultural and recreational activities in enhancing the quality of life. And if you were a disbeliever in that, and had you taken the time to come down Central Georgetown on Heroes Day Monday night, you would have seen a real live modern example of the cradle almost to those in a wheelchair, to those who are visiting, to our residents that are welcome, to the true-blooded Caymanians, both by plane and by pain, who came together to celebrate the heroes in our community. Not one uniformed policeman, not one ounce of liquor, sorry, Dilbert. <laughs> there was no report of crime, and everybody had a jolly good time. <laughs> and they've asked for it to be repeated. Sustainable economies recognize the importance of cultural and recreational activities, which will enhance our quality of life. This means we have to plan for green spaces, and I want to go on record to congratulate Dart, and no, I don't hold a brief for him or any other corporation, but we must give kudos when kudos are deserved for their effort and ensure that they develop from a holistic perspective, which is inclusive of creating innovative green spaces and recreational facilities for all to enjoy. <laughs> Both concepts share a long-term perspective considering the well-being of future generations. In summary, a sustainable economy and the concept of quality of life are interconnected through their shared goals of promoting 
economic, social, and environmental well-being. A key concern accompanying Cayman's economic growth and success to date is, are our people benefiting? I'm sure you've heard it too. Since before 2021, when we had the unsolicited guests of COVID and the advent of the 2021 elections, my political colleagues and I have heard many, many times that Caymanians are feeling increasingly left behind by what some people see as a runaway economic growth trajectory. How does the concept then of economic sustainability relate to the needs of an indigenous population that is feeling increasingly marginalized? The concept of economic sustainability involves recognizing first and foremost and addressing these needs once recognized. The values and aspirations of that population also falls in line with the said forensic valuation. Economic sustainability should not only prioritize growth, but also focus on social equity, cultural preservation, and the well-being of the native communities. Economic sustainability for local populations should respect and preserve the cultural heritage and ensure that the benefits of economic growth are shared inclusively. Policies and programs should be designed to reduce disparities and promote opportunities for local communities to actively participate in and benefit from the economic activities. This may involve targeted initiatives such as skills development, entrepreneurship support, internships, and access to markets. Economic sustainability involves empowering the respective local communities to have a say in decisions that affect them and should prioritize the overall well-being of all of our population. This goes beyond the financial considerations to encompass health, education, and social cohesion. Considering this discussion, we must then ask the question, is the economic growth within the Cayman Islands sustainable? Economic growth is often seen as a key driver to prosperity, job creation, improvements in living standards. However, concerns have been raised about the environmental, social, and long-term viability of continuous economic growth. Economic growth does not always guarantee equitable distribution of benefits. In some cases, it can, in fact, speed up income equality, leaving certain segments of the population marginalized. Ensuring that economic growth is inclusive and benefits all members of our society is crucial for sustainable development. <clears throat> Critics argue, and I would agree, that a narrow focus on the GDP growth may not necessarily translate to improvements in overall quality of life. Social factors such as health, education, and well-being should also be considered alongside of economic indicators to provide a more comprehensive understanding of development. My government, the UPM's commitment is to a sustainable economy, and it can be plainly seen in our stated vision and indeed our mission. Our vision is one of a unified government and a unified country. Focus on continuing our island's ongoing economic and social recovery through the difficult events of the past few years in a measured and sustainable manner that ultimately provides prosperity for all Caymanians and residents alike. Building on our achievements. The government's key priorities in the next two years builds on the successes since 2021 and shows a continued and renewed, or the GG would like me to say just about now, a refreshed commitment to people-centered policies and projects. Since the pandemic, we have seen Cayman's economy rebound strongly, as the prudent actions we took through the reopening process have borne economic fruit. I am therefore happy 
elated, delighted, to declare that our economic fundamentals from the demand side remain strong even today. The, Ki <clears throat> the Cayman Islands economy expanded in real terms by 5.2% in 2022 and is expected to have an expanded a percentage of 3.5 once we get all of our stats in for 2023 as the tourism, an important sector, experienced its first full year since reopening post-COVID. The rebound in this sector is expected to continue in 2024, leading to further growth of 2.6% of the year. And knowing the minister as I do, I would not be surprised if it's much higher. The strong performance of Cayman's economy has been due to robust increases in most sectors led by construction, real estate, and yes, financial services. The strong recovery of our tourism sector and continued robust performance in financial services by our also competent Deputy Premier is expected to continue to economic expansion over the next two years with a growth of 2.6 in 2024 and 2.2 .2 in 2025. Growth by industry. The hotels and restaurant sector is projected to record a growth of 29.9% in 2023. Let me say that again. 29.9%, don't take it for granted. Other countries are envious of this position. 15. 15.9% in 2024, having expanded by 59.6% in 2022, and that's almost at the tail end of COVID. The sector is expected to recover to its 2019 levels by the end of 2024, so your work is cut out for you. This, ladies and gentlemen, is relative to an initial projection for a full and complete recovery between 2025 and 2026. It is therefore worth highlighting that for the very first time during the months of 2023, over 323,000 stayover tourists visited our islands, representing roughly 84% of the total in the first nine months of 2019. The sector is expected to expand by 7.8% in 2025, being election year, Honorable Minister, get it higher. <laughs> I will pause, though, to say that Minister Bryan, by extension, the industry have the full support of our UPM government, and he will, I'm sure, elucidate later on. The transport and storage sector is projected to grow by 9% in 2023, once the stats are all in, and 5.4% in 2024. The sector benefited from strong visitor arrivals in the first half of the year, as well as strong imports and overall economic activity. The financing and insurance sector is at the heart of Cayman's economic system and has been key to prosperity enjoyed by so many Caymanians and residents in recent years. With that said, and with my Deputy Premier, Andre, Minister for Financial Services, who's here with us today as well, I will just emphasize that the UPM government is committed to its continuance of support to this sector in any possible way. It would be remiss of me if I did not acknowledge once more the Minister's and Minister's role and that of our Honorable Attorney General, Sam Bulgin, and having the Cayman Islands removed from the FATF Grey List, and more recently, the announced removal of the islands from the EU's list of jurisdictions with deficiencies in their anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism regimes. Thank you. <clears throat> These accomplishments are a testament to the international community that Cayman is committed to transparency, accountability, and good governance. Deputy Premier, I recognize that I may have ventured somewhat into your territory here today, but I believe that these outstanding accomplishments are worth mentioning twice. 
and I am happy for this opportunity to publicly say kudos to you and to the Attorney General and your respective teams. With these and other developments that the Minister will elaborate later on, the sector is projected to expand by an average of 1.2% per year between 2023 and 2024, having grown 2.9% in 2022. The business sector, which is comprised of mainly legal and accounting services, also remain relatively robust during the crisis. The sector is projected to grow by 2% when the stats are in for 2023, and 2.2% 2 .2 in 2024, having expanded by 1.5% in 2022. Employment. Our growth has always been based on work, pride, and integrity of our people. From renowned Caymanian sailors to a revered Cayman kind tourism product, Caymanians have always excelled in the quality of work we do. And can you imagine the Cayman in 10 years when we have vastly increased those educated from a tertiary perspective? With this knowledge, I am proud to leave a government that is committed to providing meaningful jobs to every committed Caymanian. I'm therefore happy to reiterate that the overall unemployment rate in these islands was 2.4% of the labor force in spring 2023. <clears throat> this was slightly above the record low of 2.1 at the end of 2022, but below the 3% recorded in the spring of the said year. While the same survey Caymanian unemployment fell from 5.1 in the spring of 2022 to 3.7 in the spring of 23. Several have observed that the upper excellence of the marketing seems to have still a glass ceiling. It is gatherings such as this that we are reminded, we are recognizing, we become more appreciative of the significance of a partnership not outside of our jurisdiction, but that charity starts at home and we practice best with those we know. I rest my case. Several of the capital projects broken down in the budget remarks are partly geared towards improving the same standard of education in our islands. Our product, in addition to our greatest asset being our people, is the services that we render. I want to assure you that this was fully intentional and a decision not taken lightly. The cabinet was recently presented with the statistics which show that individuals with technical or vocational skills earn an average of 13% more than those with just a high school education. And the average earnings of individuals with a first degree was twice that of those with just a high school education. These statistics are at the heart of my commitment to education standards. This government will continue to focus on equality for Caymanian mobility within jobs as we provide employment opportunities. We will be rolling out more policies geared at upskilling and encouraging Caymanians so that they can meet the demands not just in the public sector, but indeed the private sector. Over the near term, the demand for labor is expected to track with the GDP growth forecast. New employment is expected from the continued recovery of the labor-intensive tourism industry. The overall unemployment rate is expected to average 2.5% annually between 23 and 24. As we seek to maintain low unemployment rates over the medium term, we must also focus on measures to equip and promote Caymanian mobility within the same labor force. Inflation. Along with the economic growth, we have also had to deal with inflationary pressures. The Consumer Price Index, the CPI, inflation rate accelerated to an average of 9.5% in 2022, primarily due to the rise in price pressures on the international market, filtering through to the most domestic prices. 
For the first three quarters in 2023, the pace of inflation moderated to an average 3.9% compared to the corresponding quarter of 2022. Notably, in the first three quarters of 2022, the corresponding inflation rate was 10.8%. The average inflation for 2023 it was projected at 3.6%. As the impact of the central bank actions and improvements in the international supply temper price pressures throughout the year. For 2024, inflation is projected to be 2.5%. The most difficult challenge that I face as Premier of these islands is watching the standard of living of my fellow Caymanians be jeopardized by rising prices and the cost of living. While these price increases are not due to our actions, they impact everyone in our society, none more so than the poorest and most vulnerable amongst us. The inflationary pressures become a heavy burden on the shoulders of our people, increasing the cost of living for them and their respective families. When this government saw an unsustainable situation, we acted quickly by the following. Providing free school meals for our children in all government primary and secondary schools. And now we've added also for those pursuing A-levels at St. Ignatius and Prep School. Providing electricity assistance to over 22,000 eligible households removing import duties on essential and energy efficient items, extending the tourism worker stipend well into 2022, months after our border was open, reducing a variety of fees for seniors, including motor vehicle license and passport applications, extending the pension holiday for an additional year. We offered increased assistance with scholarships and tuitions for students and in fact, just night before last, we awarded our third maximum of $100,000 to the Caymanian female with the highest academic achievement in the government public schools, a brilliant young girl. <clears throat> we reintroduced $2 million per year to our private schools to help them enhance their programs. We increase benefits to our seafarers, senior citizens, people living with disabilities, and public service pensioners. We're known by how we treat the most vulnerable amongst us. It is therefore important that we also turn our attention to the area of housing. We made a commitment to help the Caymanians secure a home they can afford and own a piece of the rock and follow through on our commitment in several ways. Last year, we amended the stamp duty concessions for prospective Caymanian homeowners, made it far more affordable for Caymanians to buy both first and second properties. And still, while our policies remain people-centric, we recognize the role that small to medium-sized enterprises play in our economy, and we encourage the growth of small businesses. From June 2021 to June, 2022, over 2,200 small and micro businesses benefited from $1.6 million in fee discounts, which were extended through 2023 to help Caymanian businesses owners continue to support their families. Highlights of a people-centered budget. As can be expected of a government that is putting people first, we have focused our expenditure on the areas that most impact our people's well-being and success, notably in education, in health and wellness, in housing and infrastructure, while also supporting and growing our key industries in the financial services and tourism industries. These people-centric focus areas are apparent when we look at where both our operating expenditure and our planned capital expenditure will be spent in the next two years. Some of the most people-first budget allocations in terms of operating expenditure that immediately spring to my mind are as follows. Enhancing the budget of the portfolio and civil service to ensure that eligible pensioners 
currently receiving a very low monthly pension got an uplift to a minimum of $12.50 per month, ensuring that the Cayman Islands' first residential long-term mental facility will become a reality and operational in 2024. Offering property and casualty insurance through Cineco in 2024 to introduce greater competition in the market and bring insurance rates down. Ensuring the Ministry of Education plans to develop and implement a framework for free tertiary education at local universities for Caymanians. And there are many more. Before going into more detail, I would like to outline further measures we are taking to combat the high cost of living. To help Caymanian families, we will continue the free meal programs at all of our public schools to provide parents with the peace of mind that a hungry child would not commence the day as an angry child, but that their children would have as near as perfect environment to gain a world-class education by receiving good nutrition to enhance and augment their learning capabilities. Implement through the Ministry of Lands an affordable residential land pilot program in East End and Cayman Brac. We expect those um, plots, about 10,000 square feet, to hit the market at about $30,000. Continue the construction of affordable homes through the National Housing Trust and the Sister Islands Development Homes Corporation. The people-centered budget by ministry, as follows, have key initiatives, for example, my ministry first, the Minister of Education, by strengthening the delivery of education at all levels from K through tertiary, while further development both the curricula and physical facilities. New initiatives at the Ministry of Health and Wellness include the development of a national health care strategy, as well as facilitating a new Public Health Act, the PHA, and the Environmental Health Act, the HA, to effectively regulate and manage all public health and environmental health functions. The Minister of Planning, Agriculture, Housing and Infrastructures, key initiatives are to develop a comprehensive national development plan, implement the Cayman Islands Food and National Security Policy, undertake several key projects through the National Roads Authority, complete a full business case for a new Cayman to USA submarine cable for fabric optic, that is, develop a national public and affordable housing policy and a 10-year strategic plan. The Ministry of District Administration and Lands key initiatives include the execution of affordable residential landlord programs, which I just mentioned, and the purchase of land to safeguard public beach access and to create green spaces as well as public parks throughout the three Cayman Islands, and we're well on our way of doing that. I'll make a statement in the House in due course. The Ministry of Investment and Innovation Social Development is revamping its services to benefit Cayman's most vulnerable people, advancing the digital and innovation capacities of the Cayman Islands, facilitate investment opportunities that support social development and facilities in the community. The key objectives of the Minister of Financial Services and Commerce are to enhance its policies, functions, support regulatory services by providing the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority the support it requires, maintaining commercial leading edge in its financial, maritime, and aviation services, enhancing local intellectual property registration, and streamlining the licensing framework for our local businesses. The Minister of Tourism and Ports' key initiatives are to construct a new general aviation terminal, runway extension at the Owen Roberts Airport, improve ports of entry to enhance visitor experience, diversify the tourism product with a greater ecotourism emphasis, attract new film production businesses to the islands, expand emerging and secondary tourism markets, expand Cayman areas routes, which includes Sister Islands, reimagine cruise tourism. The Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resilience focus for 2024, 2025 is to implement 
a climate change policy and a relevant national energy policy. Support the creation of overarching sustainability framework to guide the work of public entities and to balance, in capital letters, to balance the preservation of our important environment with the development needs of all three of our islands. The key initiatives of the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Heritage are to implement governance policies, increase collaboration and coordination amongst our youth, sport, education, tourism, health and other relevant subject areas, establish and indeed maintain, manage appropriate sports and recreational facilities in all districts, support the preservation and awareness of the heritage of the Cayman Islands and you're in for a real treat come the celebration of Emancipation Day, which, Chamber, is a public holiday. <laughs> the Ministry of Home Affairs, key's initiative to build intelligence capabilities, support national security policy development, public safety and operational response, invest in technology to advance security and public safety outcomes, develop national policy solutions to address security, as you heard Her Excellency refer to earlier on, and public safety measures. The Ministry of Border Control, Labor and Culture. Key initiatives are to continue effective and efficient administration, implementation and enforcement of pensions, border control and labor legislation, improve efficiency in the delivery of postal services, border management and labor related initiatives, improve intelligence and information sharing capabilities of law enforcement and border security. Develop the Cayman Islands workforce, ensuring that gaps are supplemented where necessary. The ministry will continue its efforts to preserve and promote Caymanian culture. And I understand that some of that is going to be displayed even on Ash Wednesday at the agriculture show and subsequent music, music festivals. New revenue measures. To achieve our goal of helping our people thrive, meet our projections, and adequately fund important programs, I've just outlined and more, we have implemented new revenue measures. The decision to introduce new revenue measures was not at all taken lightly. And we have made every effort to ensure that our new or increased fees are non-inflationary and do not impact the cost of living for the average Caymanian. The new revenue measures in the 2024-25 budget will yield an additional sum of $52 million in 2024 and $80 million in 2025. We have heard your cry as it related to the stamp duty that we referred to. It is not included in those numbers and is under active reconsideration by the government, being a people centers government. Several capital projects benefiting our people are also planned during this budget period, which includes securing land ownership for future projects throughout the Ministry of Lands, major education infrastructure improvements, where the Ministry of Education, including upgrading to our primary, secondary, tertiary, and lighthouse school educational facilities, buildings and infrastructure for entities under the Ministry of Health and Wellness, including the relocation and construction of DEH in order to make way for the new ISM Waste to Energy Project, which is a new facility, hopefully by 2026, latest 2027. Fleet replacement for the Department of Environmental Health. Fleet replacement for mosquito research and control by a unit aircraft costing 2.5 million. Under the oversight of the Minister of Health Affairs to complete design, pre-construction work for a new prison at a cost of three million over a two-year period. Several infrastructure and housing projects are under the remit of the Minister of Planning, who you know by now is an action minister. Major road works, 26.5 million over two years. District upgrades, including parks, civic centers, ramps, jetties, and other development and infrastructural projects, 10.1 million over two years. Building and repairing homes, under the oversight of the NHDT, 15 million over two years. 
consultancy and project management services for the proposed sea cable land remediation under the oversight of the Minister of Sustainability, 1.4 million, under the Minister of Tourism and Ports, establishment of a tourism attraction facility, which we will further hear from the Minister later on, I suspect, which will provide on-the-job training for 200 Caymanian students and a new location of the craft market for $2 million over two years. While some say, or even now, may be asking, why now? And is it really needed regarding some of our planned capital projects? I must therefore respond with this quote from the American author, Arnold H. Glasgow, and I quote, one of the tests of leadership is the ability to recognize a problem before it becomes an emergency, unquote. We are seeing in today's Cayman some of the facts of previous generations not recognizing these problems. Granted, some of these problems might have been unforeseeable, but if we have the luxury of time and the gift of foresight now, why not plan ahead and ensure that we have adequate facilities for our continually growing population? Right now, we as a country are faced with the task of playing catch up in so many areas. We are trying to build roads, houses, schools, waste management facilities, sewage upgrades. It's not even on the books, but need to be. More to deal with a population that has grown faster than our infrastructure. With our planned capital projects, we are not only trying to catch up, but also to adequately prepare for future growth, future proofing. We are, in short, recognizing the need and applying relevant resources to accommodate a disaster in the future should we fail to do our duty. New capital projects are to be funded by borrowing under the guidelines of the principles of responsible fiscal management as specified in the Framework for Fiscal Responsibility, the FFR. Proposed borrowings for the next two years, and I say proposed, is 150 million. They will be used to fund government's capital and will not be used to fund operational expenditures, which will be fund from our operating revenues. Assertions have been made that we will unfairly load future generations of Caymanians with the burden of public debt through the proposed borrowing to fund capital projects. First, I maintain that this is just patently untrue, as the borrowing is prudent, responsible, and well within the FFR stipulations. Even with this borrowing, Cayman's debt to GDP ratio will still remain under 10%, making it one of the best ratios in this entire world. To illustrate this point, Japan's debt ratio is over 200%, and the United Kingdom is just over 100%. And these three little dots that you've helped us to build and you still commit by a ceremony such as this today will not put the country in unreasonable debt. But we will, we will commit to building a Cayman that is equitable for all against all social platforms. We are discussing, while discussing the FFR compliance, we would seem to be a good time to look at the current state of government finances. The government is a strong advocate and practitioner of sound fiscal management, and thereby it enables us to minimize imposition on the private sector for taxes and fees so businesses can flourish and provide employment and still find the Cayman jurisdiction as a jurisdiction of choice. The Cayman Islands government financial results for 2023 will be available later this month. Chief financial officers within government had until the 31st of January to refine the preliminary results for government's financial year ended 31st of December 2023, with adjustments now being processed by my finance team. In terms of our expectations for the financial results, for the positions of 2023, the 2024-2025 budget 
approved in Parliament last year, gave our projections as follows. Total revenues of $1 billion and $34 million. Day-to-day -day operating expenses, $1 billion and $11 million. A surplus expectation of $23 million and not the deficit projected in September of $3 million. A total outstanding debt balance of $452 million, which we pay on regularly. Bank account balances totaling $498 million. Based on the preliminary results and position, the government is confident that at a minimum, and I say a minimum because I've seen the preliminary figures, the expectations of 2023 will be met, and I dare say FS surpassed based on what I've seen to date. In conclusion, the 2024-2025 budget has been crafted with our people foremost in our mind. It offers an approach filled with optimism and hope for the people of the Cayman Islands, and not I said people, inclusive of residents. That is the formula of our success. It demonstrates the UPM government's ongoing commitment to the responsible management of our public finances. It is also a reflection of our top priorities for the well-being of all of our people. As a government, we are collectively and will continue to collectively do our best to be strategic, intelligent, prudent, far-sighted in our budget allocations. And we believe that this is the only way to ensure that all Caymanians and residents continue to enjoy a good quality of life within our shores, not just now, but way into the future. This journey to this point has been a challenging one. And I'm sure that the path ahead will bring us its own unexpected twists and turns. However, we have planned, we have prepared for the proverbial rainy day, while also seeking to expand an anticipated future growth. I believe that with our society's strong economic base, the projects of this government that we are undertaking will go a long way in ensuring sustainability through infrastructural development, improved educational standards, and sensible environmental policies. The road of success that we travel on today was paved by innovative entrepreneurs and committed businessmen and women alike, including some of you here in this room today. I know because I have worked with so many of you in my past 28 years of public service. That is why I can continue to be ever so confident that our partnership, our partnership, and the success of our Caymanian people and residents alike will continue to grow. I therefore pray that you will give us your support as we endeavor to build on the good work done to make the Cayman Islands a resilient, sustainable economy, a great place to live for everyone who call these islands home. I thank you for your indulgence and patience. God bless you and God bless these wonderful Cayman Islands. <laughs>